just to give you the plan, we are going to be in this series um, for four to five weeks, possibly a sixth week. Um, it's going to actually take us through the month of February. We've got a couple of different Sundays that are going to be pushed in there where we'll, be, where we'll take a step out of the series and be standalone messages. We're basically going to be in this series till the end of February. And then we're going to pick up a series the first week in March um, from the book of James. Uh, one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I believe it'll be a blessing to us. I believe it'll be a strategic book after we go through this series. I believe it's natural to go into the book of James. And so that's where we'll be heading for the next several months. I've got some ideas even for you um, to get prepared for James and to help you as we go through James. Um, some, some resources that we're going to give you. But we are in a new series called All Things New. How the gospel shapes our identity. How the gospel shapes our identity. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 1. You can turn there in your Bibles if you have them. We're not going there right now, but if you want to go ahead and get there. Galatians chapter 1. But we are in an identity crisis in our culture. And what I mean by that, what I don't mean by that is the progressive sexual revolution and the identity crisis that we have among genders. That's not what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm talking about a struggle to claim an identity among Bible-believing followers of Jesus. I mean a struggle to grasp the identity that was given to us by people who sit in churches that preach the gospel every week. I mean an identity crisis as in we don't comprehend who we are in Christ, but we love Jesus. Uh, people that would claim Jesus and Jesus would claim them, they're believers, but they struggle with their identity, who they truly are, who God has made them to be. I'm not going to spoil the rest of the series today by going through you know, the identity portion. We're going to get there. Um, today's title is simply... What is the gospel? What is the gospel? And for this series, we cannot understand our identity in Christ until we understand the gospel. We cannot understand how the gospel shapes our identity until we understand the gospel. And you say, okay, I've been saved, I grew up in church, I'll tune you out. Please don't. Because I believe some, some of the people who don't understand the gospel the most got saved when they were like seven and the gospel was like this thing in their past so please don't tune me out this morning please this is not a sermon this is this sermon is not geared towards those that would be unbelievers it's geared towards those of us that would name the name of Christ and be a believer. I will certainly touch on elements in the sermon today that will be for unbelievers but this sermon is for believers. I want us to fully grasp as much as possible in one sermon what the gospel is. Now books have been written on it. Multiple books have been written on it. In fact there's a whole movement that I'm not necessarily claiming a gospel centered movement that I think maybe has taken this term and made it into something bigger uh, maybe even the, what the scriptures made it into be. I want to stay biblical today. Um, but I believe the gospel is so much more so much more. You're in Galatians chapter 1. If you're not there, the, the verses will be on the screen for you. Verse 6, as Paul opens up this book, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Some strong language. It's not my language, it's Paul's. 
um, strong language about this topic of the gospel. Heavenly Father, speak through your word. Guide my thoughts and guide my words. I pray that my spirit today would be that which would be honoring to you and that the truth from your word would shine through. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. To truly grasp what the gospel is, I want to lay the foundation this morning, and I want to do so very carefully and with the right spirit. I want to lay the foundation of what the gospel is not. Before you can understand what something is, you may want to also look at what it is not. And what the gospel is not, as I said, I want to choose my words carefully this morning. What the gospel is not, and I'm going to give you some things, a a bullet list of things, and some of them may be on the screen, some of them may not. But what the gospel is not is trusting in faith, but then living under the law. The same book, Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, being saved by the Holy Spirit of God? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously no. What the gospel is not is, by grace are you saved through faith. Amen, I received that. And now I'm going to live with my willpower and everything I can do. And I got saved by the Holy Spirit of God by grace through faith. But man, I'm going to live this life and do the best I can. And hopefully God is, at the end, God's going to give me the thumbs up and the wink. It's a tiring gospel. It's a gospel that, that may start correctly but it quickly deviates from, from the biblical road of the gospel. Trusting in faith, but living under the law. As we, as we heard in the beginning of the book of, of Galatians, the chap, first chapter, there were people that were perverting the gospel or preaching another gospel, and now he's describing what that is. We're actually going to come back to those verses toward the end of the sermon today. So what the gospel isn't, it is not trusting in faith, but living under the law. What the gospel is not, and get ready, those... Those of you that have been in church, myself included, the gospel is not a prayer that we repeat. The gospel is not a prayer that we repeat. The gospel is not, God, I acknowledge my sin and I come before you and I I pray that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would give me a home in heaven and that you would come into my heart and life and change The words that we say, the prayer that we pray, we do not pray magic words. There is, in fact, there is no such thing as a sinner's prayer in Scripture. That is something that we have constructed, let's be real, to make it easier for us to share the gospel for people. And so we must understand, and and, and parents, if if you're in this room and you have young children, I am passionate about this with my kids, we need to be very, very careful how we deal with our children and the gospel we need to be very careful you say why is that josh well there's a reason why they say first generation christians are so much stronger in their faith than second generation christians and third generation christians and fourth generation christians it's because it's very easy for me as i have two young daughters especially when they were younger than they are now it's very easy for me to say daddy really wants you to do man how great would it be daddy wants you to do this and man Oh, this is going to be great. We're going to rejoice. We're going to celebrate. Well, I want to do what Daddy wants me to do. Oh, yes, certainly, man. Yeah, I had some questions, and Daddy hopped on those questions, and yeah, I'll pray that prayer. Yeah, do I want, do I want to go to hell? Nah. Do I want to get to heaven? Sure, sounds like fun. And it'll make Daddy happy? Cool, let's do it. If we're not careful, all it becomes is a transaction. All it becomes is a with the right spirit, I mean this. All it becomes is somewhat of a sales pitch. And, I, and it was great. It happened. We must understand what the gospel is not. It's not a prayer. Now, the Bible does say, with the heart man believes in the salvation and with the mouth confession is made. I do believe that if, if the Holy Spirit has begun to work in you and the Holy Spirit is drawing you and you receive Jesus, that you, you, with the mouth you confess, if you do that through a prayer, praise the Lord. I love that. 
There's nothing wrong with praying a prayer of salvation. I lead people in that. If you've been to church here long, I lead people in those prayers. But lest we get it wrong, that prayer does absolutely nothing without the heart belief behind it. We must understand that the gospel is not a prayer we pray. Here's some other terminologies that I hear for the gospel sometimes. Getting right with God. Have you made things right? Listen, I can get right with God over and over and over and over again and not have Jesus as my Savior. I hear that often as folks are, are maybe on their, 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 in their later years and they've just lived a life of sin and there's no evidence of their salvation. And, and I've been there when people are talking to them and, hey, is everything good between you and the big guy upstairs? Yeah, everything's good. I'm good. Okay. Listen, getting it right with the, with the man upstairs, first of all, I don't like that terminology, but getting it right with him, if getting it right with him means that you do what we talk about in the rest of the sermon, then by all means, call it whatever you want to. We must be very careful. The gospel is not turning over a new leaf or having a fresh start. 2020, first Sunday, here we are in church. The gospel is not, man, I've been trying some other stuff, and man, I, I need a fresh start. Man, here's my fresh start. I'm on. That's not the gospel. It, oh, I've heard this one. Sometimes we go to these concerts of, I've been to some Christian concerts, and they, they I don't know what they're trying to do, but who, who, who tonight just feels Jesus is drawing you, and you just want to give more of yourself to Jesus? What does that mean? Just give more of yourself to Jesus tonight. And then you'll have like, you'll have like deacons and elders in churches that are like, me, like, and they're like, we had 74 salvations signed at our concert. We have pastors giving themselves more to Jesus. What the gospel is not. What the gospel is not is emotional manipulation at the end of a sermon so that the pastor will feel good about himself. I apologize for my honesty. It's not emotional manipulation at the end of a sermon to make myself feel successful. I'm preaching an entire sermon here today on the gospel. If no one responds that's an unbeliever and turns and, to the good news of the gospel this morning, that does not, that does not make the success or failure of the sermon. It's not an emotional pull. It's the, my goal today is not to have Tim, uh, have Melody come up here and sing uh, King of Kings. And Tim, if she sings it like two more times, I bet somebody, you know what they really want? They're really like, I'm hungry and I'm ready to go. If, if you'll stop, I'll raise my hand. That's what they mean. It's not an emotional pull and a manipulative speaker. And can I say this, and I, stick with me, please. The gospel is not merely a one-time event that takes place, and then we continue to live our lives the same way we did before that event. Stay with me. I believe in a point of salvation. I believe in that. But the gospel is not coming to a point of salvation and then your life continues the exact same way. Nothing changes. Everything's the same. We better watch it. We better watch it. What the gospel is not. Paul had some very, very harsh language to the Galatian Christians who were being turned away to a, another gospel or to a perverted gospel. And he said, anyone that brings that gospel to you, let him be accursed. Accursed. My goal as a pastor and as a proclaimer of the gospel is not to sales pitch my way into people's minds and bypass the Holy Spirit in their hearts. And it shouldn't be any of, any of yours. What the gospel is not, we must understand. If we're going to understand our identity, where we're going in the series, we must understand what the gospel is. If we're going to understand what the gospel is, we must identify what the gospel is not. And certainly in that day, as Paul was writing to the Galatians, he goes on, and when we preach through Galatians, I can't wait for that. Whenever that comes, the Lord leads us there. It's going to be a great series. But it goes through, and it was basically, yeah, Jesus and. 
Yeah, Jesus and, Jesus and, and, and Jesus this with this and with that. There was a lot that went on there. There was so much that went with the Jews and the, and the Gentiles. There was so much with the, the circumcision, the uncircumcision. There was so much with those that kept the law and didn't. But for us, understanding what the gospel is not. So then, secondly, and naturally, we move into what the gospel is. What the gospel is this morning. And you say, Josh, I've been in church my whole life. That's fine. I need you to, to zero in with me because there's a third point to the message today. Stay with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 gives the clearest presentation of what the gospel is in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. By the way, I love how when Paul is identifying and defining what the gospel is, he two times in his definition says, according to the scriptures. We must understand that the gospel is contained within this book. And while the Holy Spirit is its, his, his moving agent, the foundation of the gospel is right here in his book. And we must always understand that. But what the gospel is, can I define the gospel? I had some help. Actually, Pastor Dustin Moore is going to be with us at the end of February. He may be closing out this series. If I get to it and close it out, I will close it out. If I don't, he is going to close it out, depending on how long the series goes. Um, but I've, I've been in communication with him quite a bit through this, and he's helped me with some things. Here's his definition, and I loved it, so I stole it. The gospel defined that God made us, we rebelled, and lived as enemies deserving of wrath. Jesus came to be the substitutionary payment for our sins and his death. We talked about that back in December. And his death, burial, and resurrection, by which we receive salvation and the forgiveness of sins by faith. That's the gospel defined. So as we think about what the gospel is, we have the definition. There's some things in that definition I wanted to make sure that we highlight as we think through this. First, I want us to see this, who we were, an enemy. Who we were, an enemy. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled or have been saved, we, have, we shall be saved by his life. For if when we were enemies, enemies, this came, this enemy that, that we were to God came through a direct bloodline from Adam. In fact, just two verses later in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. In our Adamic nature, the nature of Adam that we have, that every one of us has, not only are we born sinners by default, but we are born, because of our sin, as an enemy of God. You say, Josh, I don't like to hear that. Well, neither do I. And for those of us that grew up in church, and for those of us that went to Sunday school, it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes for us to grasp that before we received Jesus Christ, that we were an enemy of God. Well, certainly we weren't. I mean, we weren't that bad. I mean, I was a kid. And... Certainly it wasn't that bad. It's hard for us to grasp sometimes and to admit sometimes that no matter how good we were in our sins, that our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. And that we lived, before Jesus came into our lives, we lived as an enemy of God. That means even the good things that we tried to do, we were an enemy of His. That means the good deeds that we tried to perform, we were an enemy of His. We weren't simply bad, we were an enemy of God. And we were constantly at war with Him, even when we tried to do good. An enemy of God. It's a tough thing to admit, isn't it? It's a tough thing to think through that 
in my sin and my flesh who I am or who I was before Jesus came, that I was actively working against God as an enemy of his. To think about that just this week, we are, we are, we have heightened our enemy relationship with a country in the Middle East. That same enemy relationship was the relationship that we had to God before Jesus came into our lives. That same hatred or that same enemy status is what we had. So who we were, we were enemies, sinners. What we deserve, we know this, death. Secondly, we deserve death. We all know this passage in this text because I quote it all the time. For the wages of sin is, say it, death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We deserve death. Can I say this? The enemies of God deserve the wrath of God. It's part of the gospel. Enemies of God deserve the wrath of God. And can I say this about death? Jesus didn't come so that for us to escape death necessarily. Someone had to die. What I'm saying is Jesus didn't come to abolish that. Jesus came and fulfilled that. God was still just. Someone had to die for sin. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. And the amazing thing is it wasn't you and it wasn't me. The amazing thing is that Jesus died. But he had to die. That is core to the gospel. The death was not removed away. No, death was fulfilled in Jesus. He had to die. Someone had to die for your sin and someone had to die for my sin. And man, if we just added up the sins in this room, can you imagine? Someone had to die. Someone had to die. Enemies of God deserve the wrath of God, and so we deserve death. But who could change that, thirdly? Who could change that? I, I'm going through. I'm getting, I know where I'm heading, and we're going there. Who could change that? Obviously, Jesus. Perfect, without blemish. The firstborn. We talked about the Lamb of God, God in the flesh, God incarnate, Emmanuel, Jesus. He could change it. As he hung on the cross, he bore the sin of the world. He became the sin of the world. In fact, he became the sin of the world so much that God had to turn his back on his own son because he could not look upon the sin that he had become on the cross. Jesus became our sin. Think of the, the, the dirtiest, lowest, most wretched sin you can think of. And Jesus became it. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, For he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. He died on that cross. He was buried. He died in your sin and in my sin. And he was buried, but he didn't stay buried. He rose in victory. Jesus, the gospel, the death, the burial, and now the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 42 says this. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It's who we are naturally. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. As so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And the last Adam, Jesus, became a life giving spirit. I would challenge you to go back and read this text later on this week. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Listen, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's not just the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ helps us to be raised in in corruption. It has us to be raised in glory. It has us to be raised in power. It has us to be raised in a spiritual body. Jesus rose to give you life. It's the gospel. It's Jesus. It's the only one that could change, the only one who could change the fact that that we were enemies of God and that we deserve death. Jesus came. That is the essence of the gospel. And now what do we have to do? And once again, this sermon is not for the unbeliever, but if you're here this morning and you are an unbeliever or you don't know or you've got some questions, here, this is for you. What, what you must do now is repent and believe. Repent and believe. Mark chapter 1. I'm sorry for this. A lot of scripture today. I apologize. Pastor, giving you a lot of scripture. I won't let it happen again. All right, here we go. Mark chapter 1. That's the joke. Verse 14 and 15. Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Luke chapter 13, the first five verses. There were present at that season, some who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered or allowed such things? Jesus says, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Jesus is questioning and and challenging those who would say that Some sins are worse than others, and verse 5, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance. Turning from your sinful ways of thinking. Repentance. Turning from your sinful ways of acting and living. You say, do my works save me? Absolutely not. Get ready for the book of James. But if you have a salvation and you have a faith that doesn't produce some good works, take a big giant step back. Hold up. Repent. Turning from our sinful ways of thinking that we could somehow earn this salvation, this gospel, that the good news was somehow brought about by uh, 99% Jesus and 1% Josh. That somehow the gospel was, uh, yeah, all this stuff they say at church, but I know I also got to be a good person because, I mean, if I'm bad, then there's no way this is going to. No, it's, it's repenting of that. It's a change of mind in our way of thinking. But it's not just repentance. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31 say, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I would love to have people ask me that question. Hey, Josh. What must I do to be saved? So they said, believe. This was in prison, by the way, Paul and Silas. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Belief. Turning to Jesus in faith and accepting the mercy and grace that Jesus offers. What do we have to do? Listen, Jesus paid it all. We must repent and believe in him period end of story there's not a dot 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 there there's not a comma there there's a period at the end of that sentence we must repent and believe the gospel i look at it this way we must turn to him i love this term this term in repentant faith does that make sense we must turn to jesus in repentant faith Faith. And what, that word repentant is huge because what we're saying is when we turn to Jesus, we are repenting of this. And we are turning to him in repentant faith. You say, Josh, this is a lot. No one explained all this to me when I got saved. I understand. And if they had, you'd have been so confused that you would never have probably trusted Jesus. I get that. But now that you're, I told you this sermon was for believers. We must continue to grow deeper. I'm getting, I need to shut up. Here we go. 
I'm going there. I'm getting there, John. I'm going. It's my next point, though. Let me give you this quote to finalize this point, and then I'm going to go to my conclusion, my own one and only conclusion today. What the, uh, let me give you this quote. Salvation is not merely professing to be a Christian, nor is it baptism, moral reform, going to church, receiving sacraments, or living a life of self-discipline and sacrifice. Salvation is believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Salvation comes through giving up one's own goodness, works, knowledge, and wisdom. That's repentance. And trusting in the finished, perfect work of Christ. That is belief. It's a quote from John MacArthur. You can leave it up there for just a second. That's what it is. That is what it is in a nutshell. And in conclusion, what the implications of the gospel are. What the implications of the gospel are. So we have what the gospel is not. We have what the gospel is. And now what are the implications of the gospel? I gave you a definition of the gospel. I gave you Paul's definition. Apostle Paul. I gave you Apostle Dustin's. It's not, it's not Apostle. But I gave you my friend Dustin's uh, de- definition of the gospel. I just gave you a quote by John MacArthur explaining the gospel. Can I give you now what I believe is to be the gospel applied? Okay? Not just a head knowledge gospel, but now the implications of it. The fleshing out. The gospel applied. Can I give you that this morning? I believe the gospel applied is this. How the truths of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus deeply impact the way we interpret Scripture and deal with all aspects of our daily living. Please leave it up for a second. By the way, I'm sorry, you grammar people. I should be impact. It's my fault. <sighs> Carla, you saw it, didn't you? Don't lie. She's not even looking. She can't even look upon such filth. <laughs> Me either. Sorry about that. How the truths of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus will deeply impact the way we interpret Scripture and the way that we deal with all aspects of our daily living. You see, the gospel changes everything. The gospel changes everything. I've tried to block out much of um, some of the sermons that I heard way back in the past, but one, of, one statement that I heard one time, you mean something as big as God's Holy Spirit coming to live inside of you happens and nothing changes? You mean something as, as amazing as the gospel happens in your life and we just mosey right along as if, cool, felt good. No, the gospel changes everything. And the gospel changes how we interpret scripture. And I want, I want us to understand this. Um, I don't have time today to give you a theological dissertation on this. But I want us to at least understand this basic truth. The gospel will change how we interpret scripture. Because we understand the overall narrative that is taking place from Genesis to Revelation. And that is this, that God is redeeming sinful man to himself through the person of Jesus Christ. That is Genesis all the way through Revelation. It is the story of God redeeming sinful man through Jesus. That is why I will not preach or read the story of David and simply preach that it's wrong to sleep with another man's wife and then have him killed. Even though I think that's wrong. You probably shouldn't do that. All right. Don't put that on your to-do list for 2020. All right? Even though it is wrong and it is morally despicable, I'm not simply going to preach David and say, you shouldn't do this. And, oh, he was good over here, though. I mean, he could have killed Saul and he didn't. So you ought to do that and don't do that. And, man, I'm going to help you become a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify your behavior and help you become a more moral person by preaching to you about David. No, the overall narrative of David is that the children of Israel were searching for a king. 
And they begged for a king, and God gave them Saul. And then God gave them David. And both of those kings were very imperfect. And this was simply a foreshadowing of, you think you know what you need, but I have a perfect king from the same lineage of David, Jesus, that I will send you. And all, all David's life shows is, number one, the children of Israel did not know what they really needed. And number two, Jesus is coming through a messed up lineage, a sinful lineage, and perfect, righteous, holy Jesus was on his way. That's, that's what the gospel allows me to do when I am studying my Bible and when I'm preaching my Bible. To understand the gospel means that I understand a way to interpret scripture that points to Jesus. That points to Jesus. So we don't just preach moralism or we don't just preach behavior modification. We preach transformational truths that will, that will be made powerful. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So the gospel will alter how we will interpret and view scripture. Once again, there's a whole lot I could say there, but I'm not. But the gospel will also impact and alter how we live our daily lives. The gospel is simplistic in how we receive it. We must simply repent and believe, but it grows deeper and deeper and deeper every day as we live it. You see, if you've been saved in here 20 years, you ought to have grown 20 years deeper into the gospel. If you've been saved in here for 30 plus years, you should be growing and have grown 30 plus years deeper into the gospel. The gospel does not merely change our eternal destination, but it changes who we are today and tomorrow and the next day and next month and next year and the next decade and so on and so forth. But we mess that up so often. We get sidetracked into thinking the gospel is simply a fire escape from hell or a get out of hell free card. And we have a difficult time accepting the fact that the, that the work of the gospel will forever be in our lives, drawing us closer and closer to God. Back to Galatians chapter 3. I left off the first verse. The first time because I, I wanted to hit it here. Oh, foolish Galatians. All right, if, if, if we could apply it to us. Oh, foolish Keystonians. You know, whatever. <laughs> Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? It's referring back to the salvation, the, the, the cross. Verse 2, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Paul, as he was ministering to these Christians in Galatia, needed them to understand that the same grace that saved them is the same grace that will perfect them or mature them or help them grow and grow and grow to be more Christ-like and more Christ-like and more Christ-like. It's grace. So we must ask ourselves this morning some honest questions. If the gospel is that powerful, how should I live as a husband or, or a wife? In light of the gospel. In light of the gospel, how should I live as a parent? In light of the gospel, how should I live as a teenager? In light of the gospel this morning, how should I live as a boss or a manager or a business owner? In light of the gospel this morning, how should I live as an employee? In light of the gospel this morning, how should I live as a neighbor in my community? In light of the gospel, how should I live as a friend in every area of our lives, may we understand that the gospel declares us that we were nobodies, humility, and that Jesus is everything, and that we should live our lives serving those that he loves. Just as Jesus humbled himself and came to this earth for others, we too should live in gospel centrality for those that he loves, others. 
A quote that may help you. The gospel forces us to view each relationship and circumstance through the lens of the grace of God, which we freely received through repentance and belief. The gospel forces us to see that coworker through the lens of Jesus. The gospel forces us to see that spouse that we're struggling with and our, and our, and our marriage is, is, is kind of splitting apart and we don't know and there's so much tension. The gospel says, view them through the lens of Jesus. J.D. Greer in his book, Gospel, which by the way, um, if you're interested in this topic, I would suggest you read that book. I know he pastors in this area, big church, who cares? It's a great book, so get over it. Um, in his book, Gospel, um, he said this, that there are four things that we as individuals and human beings can put on display to our community to, to show the gospel, to put the gospel on display. And I, I love these four. The first thing he said we could put on is love and unity. We could put on love and unity. We could put on generosity. We could put on joy in the midst of persecution. And then we could put, a, put on miraculous answers to prayer. To simply display the beauty of the gospel. To simply display love and unity. There's much more than this. This is a concise list. Generosity, joy in the midst of difficulty, and miraculous answers to prayer. We, we, don't, we don't like that last one because we don't pray like we should. Let's be real. The goal of the gospel is not merely to get the facts right. If I'm a sinner, I deserve eternal punishment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the goal of the gospel is to produce people who are consumed with a passion for God and a love for other people. This is the beauty of the gospel. The gospel is so simple, yet it is so deep that we will never be able to fully grasp all of it. The gospel is inclusive and available for anyone, all who call, but it's so exclusive that it's only for those who would repent and believe. The gospel is for salvation, but it's for every breath you take after that as well. You see, the gospel is neither the green flag nor the checkered flag. It's the race. Does everybody understand that? The gospel is neither the green flag nor the checkered flag. It is the race. It is the journey. Hey, listen, we learned this. This is repeat for those of you that have been here a little bit. We have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. Those are all three things currently going on in our lives. That is salvation. So, salva so the gospel is neither the green flag nor is it simply the checkered flag. It is the race. My prayer is as we kicked off this series, is that we would grow deeper into the gospel. Maybe the, gosp maybe the word gospel is not the right word for the last part of this sermon. Maybe just the word grace is maybe a better word. If you would like to take everything I've said for the last 15 minutes and insert the word grace instead of the word gospel, have that. that. That's completely fine. But I pray that we as a church will grow deeper in this grace, in this gospel, that we'll have moms and dads that view their children through the lens of grace and the gospel. That we'll, we'll have coworkers that will view another coworker through the lens of Jesus and grace and gospel. That Today, when we go home and everything's been fine, and then we go home and we slip up and we say something to our spouse that we shouldn't say, and there becomes that moment, I know none of it happens to none of you, but possibly you have that moment where like you don't get along 100%. I know it doesn't happen much. May we view those times as opportunities 
to display the gospel. Love, unity, joy. May we use those times as we interact with people this week to see them as Jesus would see them, through his lens, through grace, through the gospel.